Hi everyone, welcome back to my channel. My name is Olivia and I make content about veganism and animal rights activism. In this video, I'm going to be going over some posts that I recently saw on Facebook. The posts are from a lady called Diana Rogers. Diana Rogers is a registered dietitian. She's based in Boston, Massachusetts. According to her website, she claims to be a real food nutritionist and uh, a sustainability advocate. Probably her most famous work is that she co-authored the book Sacred Cow, The Case for Better Meat. She has a website online called Sustainable Dish and she offers uh, a course called the Sustainable Course. And on this course, she promises to help you construct a diet that is healthy, but also good for the planet and your values. I'll come back to this later. She also claims that you can be a good person and eat meat because, and I quote, becoming your healthiest self is the most selfless and sustainable choice that you can make. In other words, don't worry about who has suffered for your choices and had their lives needlessly taken away from them. Just do what is best for yourself. We can all see why this is a problematic mentality. The claims that I'm gonna be discussing here are quite common arguments against veganism. And I think they deserve proper explanation and proper analysis as to whether they have any evidence evidence behind them. So in this post, Diana's making quite a lot of very bold claims, including things like millions of people across the globe can't afford to push away nutrient dense animal foods and uh, things like it's unethical and colonialist to push your privileged diet slash dietary moral agenda on others. When people make very bold and confident claims like this, you would at least expect to see a few references or sources. Throughout this whole post, there's actually only one source. If you click on the link, you'll find that the source is her own website and we can see why this in itself is problematic. One of Diana's first posts is forcing folks to eliminate meat from their diets is elitist. So to debunk this, I'd like to start by referencing and explicitly stating what the definition of veganism is. Veganism is a way of life that seeks to exclude, as far as is practicable and possible, all forms of cruelty and exploitation towards animals. And these two words, practicable and possible, are really important here. For some people around the world, eating meat is necessary for their survival. In other words, it's neither practicable nor possible for them to go vegan. An example of this would be people who live in indigenous communities, as well as pastoralists in many low-income countries. But for Diana Rogers, who lives in Boston, and for, I'm going to assume, the majority of people watching this video, going vegan is a choice that we have. According to the American Dietetics Association, it is very possible to be completely healthy on a vegan or plant-based diet at every stage of life. In fact, going vegan can reduce our risk of chronic diseases such as cardiovascular disease as well as type 2 diabetes. According to research by the University of Oxford, we can also save up to one third on our food costs by following a vegan diet. To summarize my point, not only can we thrive being a vegan in terms of our health, but we can also reduce our food costs and therefore it's unnecessary to slaughter sentient beings in their billions every single year. When we have the choice to be vegan, it then becomes a moral obligation to do so. So, because every time we eat or shop, we can either choose to increase suffering or we can choose to reduce it. I'd like to also examine the use of the word force here. I feel like this word is quite commonly used against vegans. You know, people say things like, oh, vegans force me to eat different food or change my diet. At the end of the day, Vegans can't follow you to the supermarket and check that you're buying only vegan food. In reality, all vegans can really do is give you the facts about this industry. We can show you what happens inside a slaughterhouse. We can show you what happens inside factory farms. We can show you what happens inside farms that claim to be organic and free range. We can tell you that it's been proven that animals such as cows, pigs, chickens, and fish are just as sentient and intelligent as our beloved pets in our homes. After we give you this information, we can really just hope Hope that if your morals include being against animal cruelty and yet you contribute to these industries which facilitate animal abuse on the biggest scale in the world, that your morals and your actions are completely misaligned. When we purchase meat and animal products, we force pigs into gas chambers. We force dairy cows into artificial insemination cages. We force chickens to be live shackled and have their throats slit. This is the correct use of the word force. Diana says forcing folks to eliminate meat from their diet is elitist. And I'd like to examine this word elitist as well. The vegan ideology isn't elitist at all. It's a movement with the sole goal of reducing animal suffering where practicable and possible. The idea that we can plunder our own 
oceans, destroy our forests, and use vast swathes of the Earth's land. Also, we can fatten up sentient beings in order to kill them for 15 minutes of sensory pleasure. Now that is an elitist mentality. The next post says that the notion that a meatless food system would do the least harm to both humans and the planet is born of a privileged, ethnocentric worldview. Firstly, I think there's a typo in this post. She's written ethocentric, but I'm pretty sure she means ethnocentric. For anyone who's unsure, ethnocentric means evaluating other cultures according to preconceptions originating in the standards and customs of one's own culture. This is a completely uh, disingenuous and false statement. Here are a few reasons why a meatless food system would indeed do the least harm to humans. Firstly, livestock production directly contributes to world hunger. This is because of the tremendous swathes of land that we have currently in order to graze animals and grow food for them, and yet how little we get in return. On a global scale, animal agriculture requires 77% of all our agricultural land, and yet only contributes to 18% of the global calorie supply. We have an enormous problem here because the distribution of global crops is completely out of whack. We are feeding far too many crops to animals when in reality they should be feeding humans. If we were to reclaim the 34% of global crops just consumed by animals, we could theoretically provide 5,935 calories per person per day. So decreasing our animal product consumption may actually be one of the solutions to feeding the growing population that we expect to see in the next century. But the current system of animal agriculture is also causing harm to humans in many other ways. For example, through pandemic risk. The farms that we have in place globally are the absolute perfect breeding ground for the next global pandemic. Overcrowded farming conditions can let viruses from different animals swap genes and begin to infect people. And with figures stating that 90% of all farmed animals live on a factory farm, it's no surprise that experts in infectious diseases have claimed that COVID-19 is not going to be the last pandemic. We also need to consider how the farming industries contribute to the risk of antibiotic resistance. Worldwide, it's estimated that 66% of antibiotics are used in farm animals, not people. Because because we house such a huge number of animals in poor farming conditions, bacterial diseases are likely to spread. But this often means that farmers will give their animals antibiotics routinely, which means before they've even got sick. In fact, in the UK, it's still completely legal to do this. It is expected that generating antibiotic resistant bacteria in farm animals will pose a risk to humans. But harm to humans from these industries doesn't stop there. Studies have found that people who work in slaughterhouses have a higher prevalence of mental health issues, in particular depression and anxiety. But I mean, it's hardly surprising considering the amount of suffering that goes on inside slaughterhouses. And of course, the direct consumption of animal-based foods also has impacts on human health. Processed red meat, including ham, bacon, pepperoni, and sausage, is a group one carcinogen. This is because of the plethora of strong evidence relating these foods with certain diseases, most commonly colorectal cancer, which is the fourth most common cancer in the UK, as well as heart disease, which we all know is the world's leading killer. So Diana's claim is largely false. A meatless food system would actually help solve some of society's biggest and most pressing issues. Contrary to what Diana likes to say, a meatless food system is actually born out of a worldview which seeks to reduce suffering for both human and non-human animals. Diana also mentions that a meatless food system would not be the best option for the environment. To be honest, with all the evidence-based information and studies that we have in 2023, closely looking at animal agriculture and its impacts on the environment, I can't quite believe that Diana has the confidence to make claims like this without any referencing whatsoever. Animal agriculture contributes to 14.5% of all human-made greenhouse gas emissions. In 2018, a study was published by the University of Oxford that reviewed nearly 40,000 farms across the globe. The study is considered to be one of the most comprehensive databases on food-related emissions. One of the study's main findings was that avoiding the consumption of animal products delivers far better environmental benefits than trying to purchase even sustainable forms of meat and dairy. But it doesn't just stop at greenhouse gas emissions. According to the WWF, cattle ranching is responsible for 80% of the deforestation in the Amazon rainforest. Research suggests that if everybody shifted to a plant-based diet, 
we could reduce the amount of land we currently use for agriculture by 75%. These areas could then be rewilded, which is a process where land is restored back to its uncultivated state. According to Grazed and Confused, a study by the Food Climate Research Network and the University of Oxford, land that is used to graze animals could potentially be used for something else, for food, for nature conservation, for forests, or for bioenergy. There are almost always alternatives. The question is, what do we want? When Diana makes claims about the environment, she might be referencing the idea of soil carbon sequestration. This is the theory that states that livestock may actually be able to remove carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and sequester it in the soil. This argument has been used by many farmers to try and suggest that grass-fed livestock may actually be good for the environment. However, the same study, grazed and confused, finds that any effect of soil carbon sequestration from the animals is greatly outweighed by the industry's current emissions. All of these reasons combined show us that a meatless food system would actually do the least harm to humans and to the environment than the system that we currently have. Unlike what the post is suggesting, a meatless food system isn't born out of a privileged worldview, but it's born out of a worldview that tries to make society better and tries to give a voice to the voiceless. Diana and many others campaign for better farming systems, you know, higher quality systems and away from the use of factory farming. But at the end of the day, there's no right way to do the wrong thing. If we have the choice to reduce suffering, we shouldn't just go halfway. We should try and reduce suffering to the fullest extent that we can. That's why when we have the choice to be vegan, it becomes a moral obligation. The next quote from the post is that low and middle income countries should not be forced to import expensive plant-based protein substitutes. To start off here, Diana has presented us with a classic false dilemma logical fallacy. She has presented two extreme options when in reality, many more possibilities exist. Diana is claiming that if low and middle income countries were to reduce or eliminate livestock farming, then they would immediately then have to import plant-based protein substitutes in order to fulfill their daily protein requirements. But in reality, many other possibilities exist in this scenario. And when she says plant-based protein substitutes, I'm assuming she means things like Beyond Burgers and fake meat type things, uh, but you know, it's not been made clear. Firstly, we don't require plant-based protein substitutes in order to fulfill our daily protein requirements. A whole food plant-based diet without any Beyond Burgers or anything like that can provide all of the protein that we require. All nine essential amino acids are found in plant foods, just in varying amounts. Secondly, diets that are largely plant-based are already traditional in many of these low and middle income countries. These countries don't just consume animal-based protein sources. So in the event that the production of livestock decreased, it wouldn't automatically be the case that we'd then need to import protein substitutes. According to experts, these countries need the support to increase their supply of nutritious plant-based foods, such as pulses, legumes, and fruit and vegetables. People tend to confuse a switch to a plant-based diet with a switch to plant-based substitutes, when in reality, they're not the same. Remember also that if we transitioned to a meatless system, there would be a vast amount of cropland previously used for animal feed that could be repurposed into human consumption. A good example of this is Brazil. In 2000 17, Brazil exported more than 90% of its soy production directly for animal feed. This soy often goes to feed livestock in the developed world. Soy is also a complete protein, which means it contains all nine essential amino acids that we need from our food. This is a very complex issue relating to global malnutrition and land use, but here is a quote from Grazed and Confused, which I think is relevant. In a few parts of the world, grazing systems are the only means by which local communities can obtain food but often there will be alternative uses for that land, alternatives that are possible and preferable depending on the criteria chosen. In other words, there's no reason to suggest that these low and middle income countries would have to import plant-based protein substitutes as Diana is claiming. Wherever possible, the land that was previously used to graze animals and grow their feed can be repurposed into crops for human consumption, as well as a variety of other things. Nor should they be forced to forfeit their regionally and culturally appropriate traditional food production methods in favour of industrial monocultures. Interestingly enough, we have the same logical 
political fallacy here as before. It's another false dilemma. Diana has presented two extremes, when in reality there are a lot more options. If we ended livestock production in these low and middle income countries, would they immediately then switch to industrial monocultures? Not necessarily. Diana also mentions culture and tradition here, but then the question becomes, are culture and tradition good justifiers for slaughtering sentient animals. There are many practices around the world which are cultural and traditional, for example, female genital mutilation and honour killings. But I'm sure we can all agree that just because these practices are themselves cultural and traditional doesn't provide any justification for them. To extend this logic, just because something is deemed cultural or traditional doesn't provide any justification as to whether that action is moral or immoral. Culture should never be used to justify abusive industries or practices. Just like we wouldn't ever permit FGM or honour killings, we shouldn't slaughter sentient beings unnecessarily on the grounds of culture. We have to stop viewing animals as cuisine and start viewing them as the sentient beings that they are, just like our beloved dogs and cats at home. One of the other quotes is, have you considered the privilege of being able to eat a meat-free diet? Being vegan is a privilege. As mentioned before in this video, there are a number of people around the world for whom it is neither possible nor practicable to be vegan. Diana is trying to spin the notion of privilege in a bad way, when in reality it isn't, it's empowering. Every time we shop and we eat, we have the power to directly impact the life of another sentient being. This choice is indeed a privilege, but it's also empowering. Diana's claims in this Facebook post are riddled with problems. Aside from the fact she hasn't used any sources of referencing other than a link to her own website, there are logical fallacies, and she keeps using this notion of privilege and ethnocentrism as a way of discrediting the whole vegan movement. Her claims about the environment have time and time again been proved wrong. And we know that the soil carbon sequestration potential of grazing livestock can't even come close to even compensating for the industry's current emissions. She claims that her sustainable diet is healthy, but also good for the planet and your values. If your values include increasing animal suffering and the slaughter of sentient beings who really just want to live, then yes, Diana's diet will fit your morals perfectly. But if not, then veganism is the way to go. Thanks for listening. All the sources that I've used are going to be linked in the description below, so please check them out in your own time. And if you wouldn't mind subscribing or following my Instagram, Olive the Vegan, that would be great.